Okay, so this is probably the first time that you guys are going to see someone introducing the chairman in a conference, okay? But I'm going to do it because I'm really happy about what's about to happen right now, okay? Really happy. And the reason is because the chairman of this session is a former student of this school, okay? And uh, he's now working in Brazil, back in Brazil. And the lecturer of this session is a former student of this school. It's my second favorite Argentinian, okay? And uh, he's back in Brazil as well, even though he's Argentinian, but he's back in Brazil, right? Because he did his PhD here with us. And the fact that we do have an organizer of this conference. This conference is only eight years old, okay? We have a, an organizer of the conference, which is a former student of the conference. And a lecturer of the conference, who is a former student of the conference, is really, really cool for us, okay? And um, so Fernando will be the chairman of the session. Thank you very much, Marcelo. <laughs> Okay, thanks for the introduction. So. <laughs> today, today I'll talk about it. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Leander. Leander is, is a very good old friend, so we did PhD together actually. And um, friends are for many things nice to have, and uh, one thing that we can do with friends is to send them an email while they are on vacation. And please come here and give the course, because we need, we need it to substitute Olivier Fister. So Leander was very, very kind to accept this challenge without too much time to prepare the course, but I'm pretty sure it will be a very good course, and thank you very much for this. Thank you, yeah. So thank you very much, Fernando, for the invitation, <laughs> long in advance, <laughs> while I was in the middle of, uh, of, the of holidays in the Alps, in the French Alps, without internet. That was last week on Thursday when I got uh, those WhatsApp saying, hey, can you give a two or three lecture course next week? So thank you very much. <laughs> and um, no, but really, thank you very much for the opportunity for, for all the organizers. For me, like Marcelo was saying, it's a bit like family being here. So I was here in 2007 in the first edition. Uh, in the, that was in the, in the end of my PhD. And then I was here in 2011 wh while I was in Barcelona as a postdoc. And now, well, as they've said, since March, I am like part of the permanent staff in university, in the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So, yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, so, <coughs> right, so I am at Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, but I will be talking of things that um, I learned a lot of and that happened like while I was in Berlin over the last two and a half years. And um, and yeah, please. So so okay. I would like so I, I prepare the slides very fast. So I, w I would appreciate it if you guys interrupt me all the time, all the time by asking questions. So this will help me, right? Um, <clears throat> right. So I would like to motivate my talk. Well, I mean, with like an overview of the of the experimental advance on on many body quantum technologies, right? So. <coughs> There has, been, there has been an impressive experimental progress on many body quantum technologies over the last 10 or 11 years. So I started my PhD in 2004. So in these 11 years, uh, well, now we have um, a tremendous advance of optical technologies. So we have, for instance, eight or more uh, multi-qubit entangled photonic states. And this is being done in several uh, groups around the world. Uh, we also have, uh, we can also manipulate multi-mode squeeze Gaussian states uh, where you input a laser field into an OPO and then you mix them in a beam speeder and you can make things like uh, Gaussian cluster states of very, very, very many particles. Or now what seems to be a very, a very promising perspective for the future, you can also have, you can also build linear optical circuits printed on chips, right? So where you have, like, where you generate essentially um, you use parametric down conversion to generate pairs of photons and you input them into a, into a linear optical network that's printed on a chip and then you read out. 
So this seems to be a very promising um, experimental line. And uh, this is on the optical side. And then, of course, we have an, also an impressive experimental advance in, 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 in quantum simulators with, um, with matter and light, right? So I, mean, so, I mean, there are many, many, many examples, but uh, perhaps three representative ones are, well, ion trap architectures. So nowadays, we, can, we have microfabricated trapped ions. So here, for instance, we can see a picture of uh, four times four trapped ions. So this is 16 ions trapped and manipulated by, by voltages here. And with them, people have demonstrated multi-qubit entangled state, digital uh, computations, quantum error correction codes, analog uh, quantum simulators, and also uh, bosonic manipulation, bosonic mode manipulation. So with trapped ions, you can play with internal degree of freedom of the ion, but also you can play with a bosonic motional mode of them. And, uh, and of course, uh, well, cold atoms in optical lattices. So here you have uh, counter-propagating lasers that create a standing wave. And then you, this, this, this simulates like a potential. This is, this is effectively a potential. And then you can put atoms in the wells of the potential. And you can control the depth of the well by controlling the intensity of the lasers. And with this, you can also do a variety of things. So of course, well, both science and condensates but it also you can play with uh, both fermi howard models, which is a very interesting uh, family of simulations for people, so from the perspective of condensed matter physics. Um, and yeah, of course, I mean, you can play, you can, you can, you can play with uh, quantum phase transitions, etc. Then finally, for instance, uh, we have um, superconducting uh, qubit circuits, right? This is, this is also a very, very promising line. And, uh, and there are also many, many groups around the world, and, and there has been experiments already of five or, or tens of, of qubits in which they have demonstrated, for instance, the surface codes or error correction codes. So this is also very, this is advancing very, very fast, right? So we see um, a tremendous, like a very, very, a very, very, very fast advance of the, of, of, of the experimental quantum technologies, right? So the, the, the obvious question, that stands out is, okay, well, but how do we trust the quantum devices we build, right? So this is, this is the topic of this, of this uh, series of lectures. So um, we want to build machines that are supposed to be intractable by classical computers, uh, yeah, by classical, with classical computing resources, right? So then, you know, okay, we make a 10 ion, we make a five, five qubit quantum computer, we can still predict it classically, we compare with the experiment and we can check if the experiment is correct, is correct or not. Then we repeat the, the same thing for 10 qubits, we can still more or less with more difficulty simulate the, the experimental outcomes of our, of, of, of our experiment and then we can compare. But if we move to 20, 30 or 40 qubits, then this is no longer feasible. So how are we going to be sure that we're actually building a machine that uh, does what we want it to do. You have to think that we want to build quantum simulators that are supposed to probe quantum phase transitions where, where, where the system is hypersensitive with respect to noise or, or perturbations or we can do uh, or, we, or we want to do simulations that cannot be tracked that are hard in the computational sense to simulate for a classical computer. So I like to I like to, 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 to motivate this, this question with, uh, with, with uh, this is a very nice paper by Dori Daranov and Umesh, Umesh Vasirani, where they talk about um, the possibility of falsifying quantum mechanics from a computational perspective, right? So we learn, we learn from quantum, we know from quantum computation that uh, quantum mechanics exceeds exponential complexity. So the scientific paradigm of predict and verify cannot be applied to testing quantum mechanics in this limit of high complexity. Right, so this is this is a very interesting perspective from the from, from the foundational point of view. Um, the fact that well, the the, the, the usual para, the usual scientific paradigm that we've been using for a couple of centuries of predict and verify cannot be cannot be applied in this in 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 the, in the regime of of high complexity of quantum mechanics. So I'm not saying that quantum mechanics is false, but te technically speaking, technically speaking, te strictly speaking, all the experiments that we have done where we have full control, full quantum control of the system is with very few particles, right? So imagine that quantum mechanics is false. I'm not saying that it's false, but imagine that it's false and one wants to falsify it by probing it in, in, in the regimes of many, many particles. Well, how are we going to do that? 
if we cannot predict the outcomes of any experiment, right? So this is a very nice. This is a very nice if you want a perspective paper, and uh, which which poses this question from the foundational point of view and from a point of view of, of of computer science. From the practical point of view, the situation is more or less like this, right? So this is if you want to like some arbitrary representation of quantum optics and quantum information trends, right? So here it says fundamental applied, but I mean the the ordering is a bit arbitrary. But essentially we are here. This is a proof of principle quantum simulators, right? So this here indicates more or less the, the, the time evolution of, 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 of quantum information and quantum optics. So we come from a, from a heritage of electronics, uh, computers and lasers. Then our parents started playing with NMR, linear, optic, linear optics and cavities, and now we're playing with optical lattices and non-chip quantum platforms. And we are at this stage of proof of principle quantum simulators, right? So I mean, all the things that we have done are still like baby quantum simulators that can indeed uh, be, uh, let's say, certified by classical computers because of the size. We're still doing, we're still controlling only very, very small systems. So we have a promise. People say that if we build non-trivial quantum simulators, then we will be able to do many things. That what, that, that's what we all learn in, in quantum information while, while, while start, when we start our PhDs, right? That uh, with the Fermi Howard quantum simulator, we will gain understanding of high, super, high temperature superconductivity, and perhaps we will be able to solve BQP problems, and in, in particular, we will be able to factor large numbers, or we will be able to say things about uh, chem quantum chemistry and the design of, 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 of particles and, and nanotechnology. But for that, we need non-trivial quantum simulators. And non-trivial quantum simulators need, so th there are a few conditions that they have to fulfill. So non-trivial is that well, they are non-trivial from, from the point of view of classical computing. Let's say that they are hard if you want to, or that they solve a problem that cannot be solved with a classical computer in, with cheaper resources, right? But for that, it needs certification. There's noise, we need to control the noise, and we need to certify that, that, that these quantum simulators are doing the right thing, right? So I would say that this is where we stand now. We're still in, in proof of principle quantum simulators. This is our next goal. And here, the link is certification. Right. Um, so, okay. So I, I want to more or less like start like brainstorming a little bit of, of, of different perspectives of what it means to certify a quantum simulator and what property one wants to certify. So the first thing is, okay, if, imagine that, well, we want to certify a full tolerant universal quantum computers, right? So this is like the, 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 most, the most ambitious goal, right? And with that, there would be, so, for, for, for that type of simulations, there would be some feasible strategy. So this, the strategy one is like the, the reductionist approach, if you want to, which consists in certifying each individual fault-tolerant each fault-tolerant component of a computer individually. So by that I mean, suppose I don't know. Here I have a quantum circuit, right? And this in this case, it's a, it's an instance of the Gitaev algorithm for phase estimation. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a quantum circuit, right? The, the goal is to, aid, to estimate a given phase of some unitaries, right? Doesn't matter. The, the, what I want to say is that one approach for the certification would be okay, since this um, circuit, if I can implement this, if I can implement it fault tolerantly, it means that each gate is implemented fault tolerantly. So one thing that I can do is to test that each single qubit preparation is fine, and then each individual gate is fine, and then in the end, since each component is implemented fault tolerantly and has error correction, well, then one expects that the errors will not propagate, and then you can say that, well, if I individually certify each component, then I can have trust that the, that, that the, final, outcome the final outcome will be fine, right? So this is, this is, a, this is a possible approach. But and, and from the technical point of view, it's correct. If you certify each individual component uh, the, and, and each component has error correction, then the composition of all of them should be fine. But in practice, in experiment, this thing of composition of, of individually certified components that no, does not necessarily mean that the, that the whole composition is fine. So for instance, one, 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 one question that people ask me once is like, okay, suppose there is a plane and people people guarantee that they have certified, they have, they, they, they have tested each component of the plane particularly, but they have not certified the, the plane when, when it's already built. So would you get on that plane? So, I mean, this is, this is a 
a part, this is a strategy, but it has its problems, right? So, so we want something, we want something, something better. We want something different. And uh, a second possible strategy, with a, again with a universal fault tolerant quantum computer, is to solve NP problems efficiently, right? So this is this is a, a more interesting strategy. So. For instance, so I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna enter in the in the in the, the, the technicalities of this definition because there's uh, the talk by by Professor Josa and also by Ernesto they, they they might also mention these things. So for for the sake of this talk for for the sake of this talk, all I want to say here is that this is a suspected relation between different problems that we're interested we're interested in in quantum information. So for instance, the P so. <coughs> So here are the P problems. So these are essentially all the problems that can be solved efficiently on a classical computer. So when I say efficiently, and when I'm talking about computational problems, I mean uh, whose runtime scales polynomially with the size of the system. So efficiently, in this case, means uh, runtime polynomial in, this, in, this, in the size of the system. So P is the class of problems that can be essentially that, that, that can be solved by in efficiently by a, classical, by a classical computer. And then there are the NP problems, which are essentially those that cannot, that might not be solved efficiently in a classical computer, but that given a solution, the correctness of that solution can be checked efficiently on a classical computer. Right, so the, the, the archetypical example of that is, is, is factoring, right? So we know that, well, we don't know, but people suspect that factoring is outside of P or at least nobody knows uh, an efficient algorithm that can that, that, uh, to solve to factor large numbers on a classical computer. But Peter Shore showed that it is possible to do that efficiently on a quantum computer. And a quantum computer solves efficiently this, the, the, this other class of decision problems, BQP problems, right? These are the problems solved efficiently on a classical computer. And uh, so this, this would give us a strategy, right? If we, you know, you input to the, to the quantum computer the uh, a factoring problem, and then, well, you cannot factor large numbers efficiently with your classical computer, but if the quantum computer gives you a solution with your classical computer, you can check whether this solution is correct or not, and you can do that efficiently. So you say, well, if my quantum computer is solving hard pro or problems that I cannot easily solve with my classical computers, and it's doing it right, and it also, and, and since the classical, and since the universal computer is fault tolerance and has error correction, then uh, then one can expect, that then one has some trust that the quantum computer is working right. And since it has error correction, one expects also that it's that it's that it even works right for other problems that are not inside NP. So <coughs> it is suspected that BQP is even, <coughs> I mean, has some that 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 BQP is not contained inside of P. So that there are some problems that quantum computers can solve. Uh, efficiently that are not in the class NP. So this means that we cannot check them efficiently in a classical computer, but because a universal fault tolerant quantum computer has error correction, one can expect, one has some trust, that the quantum computer is working fine if it solves NP problem, right? So this, this, is, an interesting, this is an interesting strategy and, and it's, it's indeed a, a very nice per perspective. But of course, one needs a fault tolerant universal quantum computer, right? So what happens? <coughs> what happens when one doesn't have a universal quantum computer, which is the case? I think I don't know what you guys think, but at least that there will be at least a couple of decades, if not more, until we see a, fault, a universal fault tolerance quantum computer. So we're still at a let's say at a less ambitious level, at the level of quantum simulators, non-universal machines that are aimed at solving some some specific their specific purpose. They, they, they are designed to solve a particular problem, not to, not, to, not to be universal, right? So quantum simulators, so first of all, they don't have uh, fault tolerance, right? They, they, they don't have error correction, or not necessarily. This is a non-trivial thing. I mean, error correction with an analog quantum simulator, for instance, is really some, something completely out of reach for the moment. And they are not universal. So, I mean, and they don't even, furthermore, they don't, they don't even solve, uh, they, they don't necessarily solve decision problems. They solve something called sampling problems that I think that Ernesto has mentioned, and I will also talk about it in one slide only, uh, in a couple of slides. But <coughs> what I mean is that this strategy doesn't apply. The strategy of solve an NP problem with a quantum simulator is not is is, is out of is out of question also. So, <coughs> so yeah. So this was I hope that this was a good motivation for for quantum certification. 
So the motiva so there are, I mentioned at least three motivations. So further, so experimental progress is, uh, is, is, diff is, is, is hindered by the lack of practical certification tools. So this is a practical cert thank you. Vale. So this is, a pra this is a practical motivation. Then from a, from a fundamental point of view, um, while quantum certification is about testing quantum mechanics in high complexity regimes that we have not tested. And then if you want to, there is a third thing that one can think of that I didn't mention, which is uh, quantum certification can be thought as an instance of quantum supremacy. So what I mean by that? <coughs> quantum supremacy is, refers to the fact that there are some problems, as we, as we know, that can be efficiently solved by, 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 with, quantum resource, with quantum resources, but cannot be solved with uh, classical resources. So certification is, is, can, can also be thought in, in, within that framework in the sense that I have a quantum machine and I have a classical certifier of that machine. And with that, without quantum resources, this classical certifier can certify very little of this machine. But if I give the certifier more quantum resources, so for instance, uh, single particle measurements or, two key, or simple, si simple, uh, simple capabilities, then he can certify more things. Right, so this is also this is also that's, this is also something a, a whole field that that, that 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 can be studied. Certification from the point of view of the task itself that can be done better with quantum resources that, than without quantum resources. Yeah. <coughs> so sorry, sorry, say it again. You mean the difference? So I mean, we, I, I will show I will show some examples of, of certifications that you can do with a classical with, with with a classical computer and with quantum resources. I'm not sure I understood your question. So I mean, of course, with with a classical computer, the problems that, that a classical computer solves are different from the ones that you want to solve with a quantum computer or with a quantum simulator. And therefore, the certification target, if you want to, is a different thing. But um, I, th I, th I think that, uh, that it, it will become clearer when, when I go on with the slides. Or do you, yeah? <coughs> um, so, yeah. So there has, been, there has been some debate. So, I mean, examples of, 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 of the interest in quantum certification is, for instance, some ongoing debate on, for instance, whether the D-wave uh, uh, quantum, processor, quantum processor is quantum or not, right? I'm not going to talk about that. This is just to, just to motivate that this is, this is a hot topic. Or also, uh, and this is a debate on which I even, took I, I even participated, whether boson sampling is doing something hard or not. And uh, so here we, 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 we were talking about classical certification of boson sampling. I will mention that with a single slide in, in, in five or ten minutes, right? I, I'm not, this, is not, this is not really central to, to, to the topic of this talk, but I will mention in, in, a, couple, in a couple of slides. So I hope this is enough <coughs> as, as motivation of my talk, of the, of, the, of the lecture. So this is an outline of what I'm going to, to, to be talking about. So, well, first of all, we have to define uh, what's the target quantum certification, and this is perhaps related to your question. I mean, depending, so we have to agree on what, so once we agree on what a quantum, what a quantum simulator should do, then we can certify that. But before that, we have to agree on what one expects from a quantum simulator. So this, this will be, a, a, let's say, uh, Ernesto has already mentioned that today, I will mention, I will mention it again, the sampling problems. And then, um, well, I will show like a, like a history of of, tom of the development of tomography of for 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 quantum state reconstruction, and then we will go to direct fidelity estimations, which uh, estimate the fidelity of, of uh, between a target state and, a, and, a, and a, an experimental preparation, without reconstructing the experimental preparation, and uh, and then I will present some partial conclusions. Um, <coughs> so, so yeah, what to certify, right? So this is a um, imagine that, I don't know, I give you like a simple quantum simulator which consists of the following. You have a, 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 multi, a, a many body Hamiltonian system and you can, you can, you can implement that with your quantum uh, platform of choice. <coughs> and I give you a very simple 
task. Now I say, okay, I give you a local observable. This can act for one particle or two neighboring particles. And I call this observable A. And I want to estimate the expectation value of this observable with respect to your evolved state rho t at a given certain time t. Right? This, this is a valid quantum simulation that I would, I would like to solve. I have, for instance, some condensed matter physics model, which is not solvable. There are many of them. And if it's, so it's, since it's not solvable, I cannot work out the, 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 the evolution of the state at a given time t. So, there, so th that's a valid simulation that I would like to do, to do in, for instance, I don't know, um, cold atoms in, in optical lattices, right? So I would like to, instead of trying to calculate the expectation value, which is something that I can do because I don't have a solution to that model, I would simply put it in the lab and run the quantum simulator and measure the, 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 the observable at a given time. And then I, I can estimate uh, the expectation value of my observable. But <clears throat> what does it mean to estimate, right? So I mean, as you know, quantum mechanics is, is uh, let's say, it does not make predictions of the outcomes uh, of experiments. We can only make predictions on the statistics of the outcomes of experiments. This, this means that I, make a, I, I run my quantum simulator, I make a measurement, and I get some outcome, but this is not enough. I need, I need to build up statistics to calculate and est to, to estimate an expectation value, right? So this means that <coughs> I need to prepare at least, so the, here C, so A star here is an estimate of, 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 this, of, of this expectation value, which is defined as uh, simply the average over the outcomes of, a single, of, of each single run. So let's say that now I run, C, I run the experiment C times, and each time I run the experiment, I get an outcome uh, lowercase i, lowercase a sub i, right? So for run i, I get the outcome a i. And then I run the experiment c times. So this means that I have to prepare, I have to run the quantum simulator c times, and I make the measurement c times, and then in the end of the day, I, ca I estimate my expectation value like this, right? This is, this is what we do. Um, and then, uh, if I assume that the, that the systems are prepared independently, then uh, one, one, has, one knows that, the, 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 that this average here should be close, at least when C is large, to the expectation value that one wants, right? And this is formalized mathematically, but what is called large deviation bounds. So this means that if I assume that these variables A, I are independent, then the probability that the deviation between A star and the real expectation value B smaller than epsilon is larger than 1 minus delta, where epsilon can be thought of as an error of my estimation and delta is a maximal failure probability. This is what, it, this, 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 this is what, it, what is called the large deviation bounds and there are different, there, there is a whole zoo of large deviation bounds, but all of them say, more, say something of this form, right? They, 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 say, they make a statement of this form uh, if C is sufficiently large. If the number of, if the, if, let's say, if the sample size is sufficiently large, right? So, and this sufficiently large means, most of the times, means, means that uh, C has to be of the order and lower bounded by one over something that scales polynomially with the error and the failure probability, or sometimes something that scales as one over uh, a quantity that scales polynomially with, uh, with the error and, and, and the logarithmic of, of the error probability. So, if, if the quant so, coming back again to the task, to the goal of the task, the goal of the task is to estimate an expectation value. But if I ask you to estimate it with, with too high an accuracy, then not even an ideal quantum simulator will be able to do the, the, the job, right? Because, I mean, even if, the, if, even if the quantum simulator is perfect, I have, to run it, I have to run it a number of times C to acquire statistics, right? So it has a sample, what is called a sample complexity. Right, sample complexity is the number of the, the size of the sample that I have to collect in order to acquire reliable statistics. Right, the number of repetitions of my experiment. Um, so this leads us to the paradigm of uh, strong versus weak quantum simulate quantum simulations. And people have mentioned that uh, already here, and also Professor Josa, I, I, I guess that he will mention that too. So let me just define it here for the sake of notation. So. Um, so we say that, a, that, a, that, 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 let's say, that a classical simulation of a, of a quantum simulation uh, is uh, efficient in the strong sense if you can evaluate the probability of a given outcome up to uh, 
up to uh, uh, right if you can evaluate the the, the 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 probability of a given outcome up to m digits in a time poly m n where n is the number of of particles right if we can do that if we can evaluate the the the, 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 part, the particular probability element uh, with 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 m digits of 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 accuracy and we can do that in poly poly m n time then we say that um that the classical simulation is efficient in the strong sense. But this is a bit too much, right? So uh, what the, the, the problems that, that, that quantum simulators solve, uh, the natural problems of, of quantum systems are sampling problems. So sampling problems, so uh, I mean, in, in a sampling problem, the task is to sample once from a given uh, probability distribution in poly n time. So this means that I have a target probability distribution, and I want to. So the task consists in giving you uh, examples of outcomes governed, sampled by this uh, probability distribution. And each time I generate an out an output, it has to be. Uh, uh, so so we say that it's efficient if I can do that in in polynomial time. So these are the natural problems that that quantum systems can solve, right? So these are the targets of our simulations. Right. We, we, uh, so when, uh, when we say uh, quantum certification, we refer to uh, certifying sampling problems from finite size samples. Right? This means I give you a, th uh, I give you a sample whose, whose, whose size is finite, so a number, an, an number of preparations, C, C, C preparations of a given system can be classical or quantum, and from that finite size sample, I need to give you a stamp saying this is valid or not. That's 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 the goal of quantum certification. Um, what? Um, yeah. So this is what I was saying, right? So a classical. There there are two at least two types of, of sampling problems: the, the classical output sampling, classical output sampling problems, and quantum output sampling problems. Uh, in classical output sampling problems. Uh, the, so first of all, so for n for an n body target state rho t. Given C classical outputs A i drawn from an unknown distribution P p, so so the subindex p here refers to preparation. The task is to certify that this prepared probability distribution is close to the target probability distribution, where the target is defined as a given fixed measurement over the targets the target quantum state. This is this this uh, this is more or less like the the general view of, of of a classical output sampling problem, and a quantum output sampling problem is well for an n-body target state, rho t, given c quantum outputs. So now the outputs are quantum. So these are rho i, described by an unknown density matrix rho p. Certify that the preparation rho p is close to the target rho t. Right. So this is this 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 is the the general the general statement. Um, and of course, both, well, in the end, it's about state certification from finite size sample, right? And this is what I was saying. And there are two reasons why this can be, uh, why this can be inefficient or why this can be hard. Uh, so first of all, the, the, the one is computational complexity. So the required classical computing resources can scale exponentially with the system size. But in this problem, so when we talk about computational problems, well, we, we only care for the runtime of your of, of your of your of your sim, of your classical simulation. But but for estimation problems of this type, for certification problems of this kind, we also have the difficulty of sampling complexity, right? So here, we're interested in in, in let's say if I have I will define later what is called a certification test. So we will say that a certification test is efficient if both things. Are scaled polynomially with the, with the system size. The runtime of my certification test, once it's given an input, but also the sample complexity. I mean, the fact that it requires only a polynomial number of preparations of my state. Right? If if given a pre if given a number of preparations, my my, my 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 certification test runs super fast, but it requires an exponentially large number of preparations. It will still be uh, inefficient, right? In the end, efficiency is about uh, a, run a, a total runtime that scales polynomially with, this, with the system side. And in this case, it requires also that the number of, of experimental runs be uh, polynomial with the, with the system size. Uh, okay, so yeah, I should talk 
just uh, I'm not going to focus too much on boson sampling, uh, and I know that there are also other people that might talk about it, but let me just show it as an example. I mean, so in boson sampling, um, so the problem is the following, right? So I mean, you're given a random unit, so there are, uh, it, one way to see this with, uh, with a linear, as a linear optical circuit. Um, here you have M modes, and you have N of them that are initially populated in a Fox state with, with uh, one photon. And then you have m minus n ones that are initially in the vacuum state. And then you input that m mode state into a linear optical circuit that is described by a unitary matrix U. And then, in the end of the day, what you want to do is you, you measure Fox you, you, you make Fox state measurements in the output, and you, you obtain a string of, of symbols S that can be 0, 1, 2, 3, or such things, right? And, and the problem, Boston sampling, is for a fixed random unitary that is drawn from, from the hard distribution, this is the, the, the uniform measure in the space of unitaries, uh, uh, for a fixed random U, sample uh, approximately from the output distribution of fog basis measurements. Right, so this is, this is a, if you, is, this is a, this was a very nice result because it's shown that for a given scaling of the number of modes and, and the number of, 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 of photons, this problem is hard uh, for a classical computer. But, Hard, we're talking about the sampling problem, right? So it means that uh, the, the task of providing you a sample that is governed by such probability distribution is difficult for a classical computer. And, uh, and the nice thing is that, well, there was lots of hype about it because it can be efficiently, efficiently simulated by a, quantum computer, by a quantum simulator, and namely a, a, a very simple one composed of, of linear optics and, 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 and Fox state inputs, right? This is, this is, this is not un, a universal quantum computer. I should also mention that this is more or less, if you want to, this is, this is related to another problem, which are IQP circuits. So these are instant, this is so-called instantaneous quantum computation composed only of, of commuting gates, but I, I, I guess that Professor Josa might mention that. And this is uh, something not similar, but I mean the, the statements are in the same direction, but for qubit circuits. Um, so, I mean, so what, what, what's, what's, this, what's all this hype with Boson sampling? So uh, in Boson sampling, so the target distribution, so P, the, the target distribution, the, the probability of a given uh, of a given uh, outcome string S is proportional to the, perm to the permanent of, uh, of, of the sub-matrix of an n times n sub-matrix of the, of the unitary U. And calculating permanence is something very, 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 very hard for a classical computer. So in this case, calculating, I mean, so calculating the, 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 the outcome, pro the probability of each outcome in the, in the Boson in, for Boson samplers is something very hard. But, um, but, uh, and what does it mean? So here, um, let's say, what, I mean, one nice thing about Boson sampling is that uh, hardness is proven even if one wants to sample approximately from the target distribution. This means approximately in total variational distance or, or one norm distance, which is defined in this way, right? So, I mean, um, so you have the target distribution and, the, and the, the prepared one, and then the one norm distance between them is essentially the sum of the absolute value of the differences of each uh, probability element. Now, suppose that I want to certify that. So this is just to explain the difficulty of the classical certification of, of, of such simulations. Suppose that I want to certify that. This means that I have an unknown, so I have a finite size sample, and this is governed by some experimentally prepared distribution that I don't know, and I want to estimate its total variational distance to the target one. But the total variational distance involves a sum over all, uh, over all possible string, strings S, and there are exponentially many of them. Think that each of these strings can be 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, so you have, you, have, you have an exponential number of strings. So this means that to estimate this thing, if, if, the, if the distributions are, are, are uh, unless the distributions are very localized, so in the end of, so I mean, you can think of them as histograms, unless the histograms are very localized, uh, you, will have to est you will have to estimate uh, an exponential number of columns of the histogram to be able to say something about this, this, uh, this distance. So these are very, very hard to estimate because no matter how much classical computing power I have, I will need to, in general, I will, ha I will need to acquire an exponential number of, 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 of statistics, right? Uh, so certifying Boson sampling can be hard 
yeah, both be, from the computational complexity point of view and from the classical com uh, from the classic uh, from the sampling complexity point of view. So what we did um, in 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 this in this paper was essentially to prove that well the probability for for a, for a run for a for a hard random u that you have a string whose probability so a, a string outcome whose quantum whose probability is larger than exponential is something exponentially small. So this means that the probability, I mean, so this this is this is what we call that the 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 the, the, the ideal Boson sampling distribution is very flat in the sense that with a very high probability there will not be even a single probability element that will be larger than something exponentially very exponentially small. Another way to see that. Uh, is to uh, realize that um, Boson samplers generate lots of entropy and then uh, sampling problems from, for, from, from distributions that generate lots of entropy can be, uh, can, can be, can be let's say, are, are, is, are indistinguishable uh, from another um, classically efficiently uh, sampleable distribution by circuits of fixed polynomial size. This, leaves, uh, this still leaves the question of whether there is a classically efficiently sampleable distribution that uh, that cannot be distinguished from the ideal Boson sampling in poly time, right? But um, yeah, efficient classical certification of Boson sampling seems very, very unlikely. There are there are techniques for there are benchmarking techniques, in the sense that there are schemes to efficiently say whether you have some multi-mode coherence and such things, but like the, the, the strict. So the strict certification uh, that can be done efficiently classically is very unlikely. So this was all I had to say about Boson sampling. Um, yeah. Yeah. Here. Yeah. So, right. Um, so I mean, what what. Well, here, here it means that um, you can sample with with a circuit of 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 uh, of, of poly size, you can you, you can efficiently sample from uh, uh, this from a, from a probability distribution. No, sorry, uh, you can efficiently with a classical computer, you can efficiently sample from a distribution that, if you give it. To, if you input to some distinguisher composed of of, of a circuit of, of polynomial size, it cannot be distinguished from the um, target distribution from the ideal target distribution. But that's one thing, and another thing is to say that it requires a polynomial time to be distinguished. So remember that for. No, no, that's that's um, well. I mean, one one limitation is that it. That it runtime is polynomial with the size of the system, and with with the, the size of the input problem. And another limitation is that it occupies only a polynomial amount of space. If you want to, it's a different it's a different type of of circuit, right? Yeah, it's it's a bit technical. I guess we can discuss that with Fernando also. But um, but the thing is that yeah, so it's an open the, the the question where you can do that efficiently in the sense of of uh, of doing it in a Polynomial amount of time is still open, but uh, everybody believes that it's very, very unlikely that this will happen. Even even Scott Adamson and, and Archibald, they, they believe that that's the case. So, so. yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah. Yeah. Right, true, yeah. No, uh, so what he means is that if, let's say, you fix you fix a polynom you fix a circuit of pol of of polynom of a given polynomial size of a given order, right? And then I can always find you another circuit with a large, with a polynomial, also which polynomial, but with a with a larger order, that will cheat you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, thank th thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's all I had to say about Boson sampling. And uh, so now, 
Yeah, okay. Uh, so now we, we, let's say, now, now the thing is to talk about quantum states, uh, quant ah, sorry, here is a, <laughs> an extra from, quantum state certification from finite size samples, right? And of course, our, the, 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 grand, the, the grandfather of all this thing is quantum state, uh, well, quantum state char characterization, and the grandfather of all this thing is quantum state tomography. So, um, there is a long history of quantum state characterization of, or quantum state tomography, right? Uh, well, quantum state tom with quantum state tomography, re you can reconstruct the full experimental preparation of a quantum state. But of course, it requires an, an requires the measurement of uh, order d squared observables, where d is the dimension of the system. And if we have an n-body system, then the dimension d scales exponentially with n. So the, the, the number of the number of measurements, the number of observables that you have to, to do to, to, to implement full quantum state tomography scales exponentially with the size of the system, right? And, uh, and, of, and therefore it's exponentially expensive from all points of view, from the computational point of view and also from the sample complexity point of view. Um, then, well, I mean, the history is very long, so I'm not going to... I'm not going to say all the different techniques that appeared, but I will just mention some remark, some 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 ones that I find remarkable. So one is compressed sensing, that that uh, with which you can reconstruct states that are uh, so whose density matrix matrices are sparse, so that is well approximated by low rank density matrices. And uh, here, the number of measurements uh, is significantly is significantly better than here, right? So here we have d squared. And here we have d log d times r, where r is the rank of the of the of the density matrix we reconstructed. So this is still this this is still exponential, but it's a considerable improvement with respect to that. And then there is a variety of of of, of techniques that appear. Right, so a remarkable one is permutational invariant tomography, in which you efficiently reconstruct the part of the experimental state that is symmetric with respect to particle permutations. Yeah. So that, that, that is not full rank. You, you are given a density matrix, and in general, if imagine you have n qubits, and then the rank can be, in the general case, can be 2 to the n. Well, sparse in the sense that it, it contains, so if you look at the matrix, it contains many zeros. That's sparsity, right? And then it, 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 it translates into, the, it boils up to, to being low rank. If you, have, if you have a promise that your preparation is low rank, then you can run uh, this compressed sensing, te te sensing techniques and you will be able to reconstruct your preparation with a number of, of, of measurements of this order. Yeah. Any other question? Um, then, well, then, then there are many other techniques that appear, permutational invariant tomography or uh, w one, one very, very nice that I will talk about in the end, which is matrix product state, right? Which efficiently reconstructs states well approximated by matrix product states. And I will say what matrix product states are in, in a few slides. And of course, there is lots of, lots of literature of, 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 qu of quantum process tomography also that I, that I will not mention. So let me um, focus on quantum. So, I mean, I will say this is a very long story. I will not tell the whole story. I will just, I will just tell the beginning of the story and the end of the story. Namely, I will mention what quantum tomography is, and then I will mention what MPS tomography is, right? So the beginning and something that is more or less the most advanced technique. Um, right, so imagine you have, you have a, a, an experimental preparation, rho p, and then uh, this, you, you expand it, in, into, in, te in terms of a complete operator basis, which is a tensor product of operators P, I, alpha, I, where each, where each of these guys is a complete operator basis for qubit I. So the, the archetypical example for qubits is the, the, the Pauli, Pauli matrices, right? In the Pauli matrices, this would be, well, for alpha, alpha I can be 0, 1, 2, or 3, corresponding to identity, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, right? So this is a possible decomposition that you can do of any state. So you see that to determine this, to, to, to determine, to reconstruct who rho p is, you need to, um, you need to uh, measure, uh, well, order d squared observables, right? Where this, where this is, uh, where, where d is equal to the local dimension, so, min so capital D, is the total dimension, and small d is the local dimension of, of each qubit, right? So here, you immediately see that this scales exponentially with the system size. 
And, uh, and of course, it requires computationally very expensive classical post-processing of the experimental data. I say that because you go to the lab and you acquire data. And suppose that you have an estimate of each of these, of these coefficients. But now you input that into your density matrix and you look at the outcome of that calculation and you get a, a, a matrix that is not even positive. This can happen because, you know, you go to the lab, there are experimental errors. So you input your data directly into your density matrix and you get something that, it, that, might, not even be a density, that might not even be a quantum state. So it requires an optimization. You get your data and you need to optimize that, and this is a very heavy optimization, right? So, so, there's, uh, so the, the nice example that people like to show is uh, the, the Innsbruck experiment of 2005, where they, had, um, uh, where they prepared W states of up to eight trapped ions, and then, of course, you have to store and optimize over a huge uh, number of classical data, and this is, this is certainly not a scalable option, right? So, um, right, so, as I said, I will tell the end of this story before we move to, the diff to, to a different topic, to the topic of direct fidelity estimation, which is uh, MPS tomography, right? So what is an MPS? So MPS stands for matrix product state, and people, uh, you might have heard of them in many, many, many contexts. These are very popular guys, and uh, these are states that can be written in this form, right? So any state, so here, so I mean, here we have the sum over I1, IN, so referring to subindices that label each, each uh, single qubit, and from 1 to D, the local dimension of each qubit, right? And here is, computation, is computational basis. So typically here, if we have any coefficient, then this is nothing but a general state. But matrix product state have the peculiarity that, they can, that this coefficient can be written as the trace of a product of some matrices. And these matrices, so, so say that I say that these matrices are R times R matrices. And where, when R is fixed and small, this is a very efficient representation. Because instead of requiring um, an exponential number of coefficients, that would be the general case for an arbitrary state, here you have something that scales linearly with the size of, with, the, with, the, with the number of qubits. To, so, so there are only this many parameters in this decomposition. Of course, uh, the question is how, how, how big or small is R? When R is sufficiently large, then this uh, can represent any arbitrary quantum state and then it becomes exponen ex exponential again. Right? But, when, but for the cases when R is fixed, then this is very efficient, very easy to handle with. So um, one way to represent them classically, uh, sorry, uh, uh, graphically, is through what is called a valence bond picture. So here what I'm trying to represent is like a chain of, of qubits in blue, right, which, which refer to this, um, to, to this physical state. And one way to think of that is through uh, some virtual particles here. So the physical state can be thought of as a collection of virtual uh, maximally entangled states psi r onto which I apply a projective operation corresponding to this matrix A here. So here we have like a balance, like a, a, a balance bond, and here another balance bond. These are simply two particle entangled states with uh, with dimension r. And then what you do is you apply an oper you apply a projective operation onto these two uh, virtual qubits and obtain a physical one. Um, I don't want to go too far away with the technicalities of this. I just want to say that this this balance bond picture is uh, interesting to see that the entanglement content between, let's say, one physical particle and the rest of the chain, in the end of the day, is dominated by the, by the dimension of this, of this singlet here, right? So, I mean, in a particular, so, let's say, in, in a general state, you look, at, you, look at, you look at the reduction, you look at the single, single, single qubit reduction of a state, and then it can contain lots of entanglement with the rest of the qubits. Of the qubits. But for this type of state, it cannot contain more entanglement bits than, than those carried by these by this, um, virtual particles here. And uh, so the bond dimension R is the rank of the single qubit reductions, so the reduced state of single qubits, and uh, the log D of R measures the effective entanglement bits. Right? So this is essentially nothing. I'm, 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 measuring, I'm measuring the entanglement of a single particle and the rest with the dimension of these uh, virtual, virtual singlets that I put here. And there are many, many reasons why uh, people like these states. They have uh, the correlations between neighboring 
na between neighbors are exponentially uh, exponentially um, so expon exponentially larger than those with with that are far away. They satisfy something that is called area laws. They are good to approximate ground states. They they are useful to, for for numerical simulations and and many many other things. But there is one picture that I like to show, which um, which is about like this, the physical corner of Hilbert space. So people know since since many years that if you look at the separate the set of separable states and you compare it with the total uh, set of states, then the separable states are exponential. Uh, are uh, an ex the volume of the of the set of separable states is exponentially uh, smaller than the, than the total space of Hilbert space. But even if you even if you allow for like if you think of the physical states, namely all those states that can be prepared in a polynomial amount of time by local Hamiltonians, even time dependent, time dependent local Hamiltonians, namely those that involve only local interactions, then the set of those states is also exponentially small with respect to the total Hilbert space. Or, or I mean, so uh, this, this can be uh, poly local poly time dynamics. This can also be a, a circuit of, 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 of universal gates. So this means that even if we have a quantum computer or, or, or a fully general, uh, or a, let's say, or, or a universal quantum simulator, we won't be able in a polynomial amount of time to generate all possible uh, pure states of Hilbert space. Nani? Sorry? Of the local system? The, the small d? Yeah, yeah. So for any for any integer d, for any q dimension, this happens. I don't know if this, I, I don't think this is proven for for um, harmonic oscillators, for bosonic uh, modes, but I guess it's also the case. Yeah. So for any for any d, and where, where d is the dimension of the local q d, then um, the size, so, so the num, if you want to the number, the number of, of pure states that exist in Hilbert space is um, scales doubly exponentially with uh, with with the number of qubits, whereas the number of 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 states that you can prepare with say a circuit composed of a, of polynomially many gates from a universal set of gates is only polynomially with this, with a, with a system size. One is polynomially, the other is uh, sorry, ex, ex, uh, yeah. one is exponentially large, the other is doubly exponentially large. There is a very simple counting argument. We, we can, I can show you, I can show you that later. But yeah, this is very remarkable. That so, so that's why people talk about the physical corner of Hilbert of Hilbert space, and that's why people like to look at this MPS because. Uh, independently of whether you can use them to 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 to, to classically simulate uh, uh, quantum simulations or not, they are more or less like a nice representation. To they they oc occupy a significant fraction of the physical state. So some people say that well, representing states with with vectors that live in Hilbert space is perhaps a bit too much because there are many states that are that are unphysical. Un so perhaps we need other representations for quantum states. And these other representations go in this direction. There are, general, there are higher dimensional generalizations of these MPS. But this is something that I like about them. I'm not interested in numerical simulations, but as a representation of states is, is, is something that I find very nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. This, 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 this results. This, this, this results of the exponent of the relationship between the volumes of these two sets have been proven for 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 pure states. But I mean, I guess you can extend them to to make. Huh? Yeah. Okay. True. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, this the, the this step here is pictorial. So the most important thing here, I mean, forget about the separable if you want to. Perhaps, I yeah, it's it's measure zero. Yeah, it's measure zero. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't really care much for the sep. So I, I guess I should have shown this picture without the separables. The, the only thing that I'm that I'm happy about this picture is the connection between the, the, the let's say MPS and the physical states and the total Hilbert Hilbert space. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, okay, so people have shown that you can 
uh, reconstruct MPS efficiently. So this 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 would be this would be the result, right? So uh, if you have an MPS, so it is known since since some since at least yeah some 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 years that if you have an MPS uh, phi, it can always be prepared by a sequence of local gates. So this means that if I take if I take uh, let's say uh, initially Q digits in 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 a pure state of a computational basis, I can prepare first locally an entangled state here, and then I I can apply entangled gates that act only on uh, a given number kappa of of local neighbors, and then to that state I apply another uh, gate on the on the next k kappa neighbors, and then on that I apply the same gate on the next kappa neighbors, and I repeat that sequentially until I build uh, my MPS. So every MPS can be prepared in that way. The only difference being the range of this unitary gate, right? So there, by, by range I mean on how many neighbors I have to act, right? But um, but so if this is true, then I can then then, then it's also true that I can. If I give if if I give you a, an MPS phi and I know who these unitaries are, then I co I can by sequential application of these unitaries I can disentangle all the all the uh, all the, all the all the qubits right I can I can transform my MPS into a product pure state except for the last cap, cap, kappa minus one particles um, uh, into into uh, yeah I can do it like that and of course kappa is related. To the uh, to the entanglement to the effective entanglement bits contained between the part the bipartition of a single qubit and the rest of the chain. Um, now this is known since long since long ago, and what these people what this what these people sh t took advantage of that to show how you can reconstruct that reconstruct MPS efficiently in the lab. So if this is true, then uh, it is also true that if I Say that I go to the lab and I instead of doing full tomography of the of the of the chain, I just do tomography of the reduced state of the first kappa neighbors. Right? I have n qubits, and say that kappa is equal to three in this example. Right? I go I go to the lab and I do only full tomography of the three qubit state. And if this is true, it is also true that there is that that with this unitary I can disentangle the first qubit, the first qubit from the other two ones. So I have my, my three qubit state, and I can disentangle the first qubit in this three qubit state from the other two, with this unitary like that, and uh, and uh, and this gives us a hint of how to reconstruct MPS in the uh, MP matrix product states in the lab, right? So you go to the lab, and you tomographically reconstruct the reduced state of the first. So suppose for the moment that the experimental preparation is pure and it's, it's described by an MPS that I don't know. Right, so you go to the lab and you tomographically reconstruct the reduced state of the first kappa qubits, uh, and now you find, since it's just a three qubit uh, state, you can easily find the unitary that disentangles the first qubit from the other two, and now you go back to the lab and with that unitary you apply that to that to your state, right? So when you apply that to your when you apply that unitary to your state, now you have a system in which the first qubit is disentangled, and then you have an MPS for n minus one qubits. And now you repeat the process again. I make tomography of of the reduced state of qubit two, three, and four, and I iterate this process until the end, until I have uh, the whole sequence of unitaries and the final state eta of the of the last kappa qubits. So you see that this process. Uh, delivers a pure MPS as a reconstructed state, and and of course it scales linearly with the size of the, the, the number of the resources scales lin scale linearly with the size of the system, because I just need to do at most n reconstructions of three qubit uh, reduced states. I don't need to do full tomography of the of the of the full n qubit state, right? So this scales very well, and of course what happens uh, in the lab. You will never have a pure MPS psi. You will have an experimental preparation described by a density matrix rho p. But then what you do is you do tomography of your first three qubits, and now you look you, you you can diagonalize this three qubit matrix, and you can truncate it in such a way such that you 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 keep only the the, the let's say the dominant R eigenstates that concentrate most of the mass probability of your state, and the rest you truncate. 
And now you do the same. You go, but this is enough for you to, up to, to get a unitary. And then you go to the lab, apply your unitary, reconstruct the state of, of qubits 2, 3, and 4. It will give you a full rank matrix. You trunk it again, and like that. And people, these people have shown that the cumulative, that the total cumulative truncation error can be efficiently tracked and grows only linearly with the system size, linearly with n, right? Uh, as I said, this, this, has the this, this has the advantage that only uh, tomography on k neighboring qubits is, is uh, required, but you need to have k qubit unitary control. And then, of course, this is restricted to MPS. But it's, a, it's indeed a very nice technique, right? But, but this is for full state, so, so let's say, state reconstruction, right? And, uh, and, uh, and actually, what one can do something, one can do something simpler, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes, indeed. And uh, uh, this, I mean, well, that's that's what I meant by this um, cumulative error. Yeah. So when I say when I say this one here, um, let me say when I when I refer to to the total cumulative error, let me see where it is. Here, so, oh, God. <laughs> well, when I when I when I refer to that, w one can track, one can keep track of the total cumulative error due to your truncation. I mean the, for instance, the one norm distance between your reconstructed state and your preparation. Let's say, even if the preparation is not an MPS, you can have an estimate of the, of how much, how far away you are from that. And I will come back to this point in the next lecture, actually, because you can have a, a, fi a lower bound to the, fi to, the, to the fidelity between your actual between your actual preparation and the target MPS state. Uh, yeah, yeah, Mateos. No. I mean, if since you have, I mean, if the so there's there is an assumption. So let's say let's put it like this: if you know that your that your state is an MPS of a, of a small and constant bond dimension R, you know that you will always be able to disentangle the first qubit from the rest of the chain with a unitary that acts only on kappa plus one neighbors. So, so you go to the lab and you do you, you do tomographic reconstruction of, of just the first kappa neighbors. Now you go back to to your office and you input that into your classical computer and work out the unitary, and then you go to the lab again and apply the unitary. Now you have disentangled the first qubit from the rest of the chain, and now you do tomography on qubits two, three, four. Go to the to the, to your office again, work out the unitary, go back to the lab. So it's a sequential. If you want it, so you, you need. You need unitary control on kappa on kappa qubits. Right. I mean, so you go to the lab. It's it's not an MPS. It's a full rank state, but you truncate it, and then you apply this as a composition. And by following by iterating this process, you end up with a you will end up in 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 your office. You will end up with a description of a of a pure MPS state, which approximates the mix prepared density matrix with an error that you can keep track of and that scales only linearly with the system size. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, so, oh uh, yeah, okay. This is what happens when you make animations to make your slides nice. Then I have to. <laughs> um, right. So. Okay, but as I said, well, we 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 will we will slowly approach in the next in the next lecture. I will become more technical about the definition of what it is a quantum state certification test. But we see the first thing that I hope is clear so far is that reconstructing the full state is not only expensive, but is also unnecessary from the point of view of certification, because to certify something means to guarantee that your preparation is close to a given target. And to to and to to certify that it's close to, to certify that a preparation is close to a given target, I don't need to know exactly 
what my preparation is. I just need to know to have an estimation of the distance of the closeness between my, my preparation and the target. So there are very nice techniques that are called fidelity estimation, which do not require on the on the on the on the tomographic reconstruction or, or on the characterization of your preparation. These techniques they can uh, estimate the fidelity of an unknown experimental preparation with respect to a known pure target state without characterizing the preparation, right? So the, so the scenario is the following. Imagine you want, to, you, want to, you want to measure the closeness between your preparation and your target with a fidelity. Um, so there is a target state rho t, which is typically pure. It's a pure state that you, that, that, that you know. And there is an, an actual unknown preparation rho p. And then the fidelity is defined by this expression which reduces to this simpler uh, Hilbert-Schmidt inner product between rho t and p when one of the states is pure. So in this case, so, so we, we, most of the things that we can say are for, for pure target states. So now let me decompose. Let me, let me take rho, let me take any state. So rho can be rho t or rho p. This is a general decomposition. And let me decompose it like this. So I, I choose again this um, orthogonal operator basis for each qubit. This can be, for instance, in the case of qubits, the Pauli matrices, or in the case of Q modes of continuous variable systems, this can be the displacement operators. Um, and, now, and now I define a characteristic function evaluated on point alpha corresponding to state rho as the expectation value of, this, of the product of these operators with respect to rho, right? I mean, essentially what I did, well, uh, this is nothing. This is the same, the same decomposition that I was showing in the slide when I was talking about uh, full tomography. Now, if I decompose my states like this, then I can write the fidelity. So look at this trace, uh, at, this, at this product here. I can, I can write the trace as the convolution of the two uh, characteristic functions, right? So nothing. I mean, I just write row t like this, write row, row p like this, and I input that here, and I obtain this convolution, right? So easy. Now, if you want to, I can write, what, what, what I can do is the following now. I, can, I, can, I take this expression and I multiply and divide by chi of rho t. So if I multiply, so I mean, I can define, I can define a distribution pt of alpha, which is equal to chi of rho t squared. And then since I multiply and divide by, by chi of rho t, then I have to define a, a variable xp, which is defined as chi of rho p divided by chi of rho t. Right? So I did nothing. I took this, I multiplied and divided by chi of rho t, and I identified chi squared of rho t as a, as a given probability distribution, and, and I identify a random variable, which I called x of xp of alpha, as the ratio between the characteristic function of the preparation and the target. Right? So, easy. Now, why is this thing interesting? Because, uh, you know, since due to normalization, it happens that, that this thing is, is, a, is a valid probability distribution. It's positive and, and, it's, and it sums up to one. And then, I can, then I, what I can do for, for the estimation of my fidelity is, instead of measuring, uh, let's say, instead of reconstructing the state, I can use this distribution as a relevance distribution that indicates me which observables I actually need to measure, right? So I do the following. You give me a preparation, and I know what my target state is, and then I define this relevant distribution, and now I sample from this distribution. This is a, this is a, a relevance distribution uh, that, will, that will give me a point alpha with a, distribution, with a probability given by this expression. So now I sample from that di distribution, I get an alpha. I, with this alpha, I go to the lab and measure the observable corresponding to this alpha. Now, next preparation, I sample again from this distribution. This gives me another alpha, and I go to the lab and measure the observable corresponding to this alpha. Next preparation, sample again from the distribution, obtain an alpha, and go to the lab and measure the observable corresponding to this alpha, and so on and so forth. Like this, I can reconstruct, I can directly reconstruct the fidelity uh, by randomly measure observables according to the relevance for rho t. So this is very nice because instead of estimating the whole state, I look at, the, I, I look, I look at my target state. And this target state has some characteristic function. And, 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 and the coefficients of this characteristic function tell me which observables 
are more relevant for this target state. So then I go to the lab and I randomly measure only those observables that are that are relevant to my target state. So this is this is something this is something that I, I find very elegant that you can you can estimate the fidelity as the expectation value over the target distribution of a random variable xp, right? And then so how many measurements? How many how many how many observables do I need? So again, we use large, uh, yeah, so for this we'll use large deviation bounds. So an estimation of, so again, the fidelity is the expectation value over PT of, of the random variable XP. And then I estimate it with an estimate XP star, which is given simply by the average of the measured values in each experimental run. So now I do L experimental runs, and in each experimental run I sample a point alpha i, and then I go and measure the, 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 the value of the variable x for this alpha i, where alpha i is sampled from the target distribution, is drawn from the, from the target distribution, is chosen randomly from the, from the target distribution, right? Uh, and then, well, now how do we know, how do we know, I mean, how do we, how do we know the quality of our estimate? Well, this is, for this we use, uh, uh, let's say, um, large deviation bounds. The simplest one that you can think of is Chebyshev's inequality. So this is a very, uh, let's say, a very standard large deviation bound that tells you that the probability that your estimate deviates from the actual expectation value by more than a constant additive error epsilon is, uh, is upper bounded by some fixed delta, uh, which is the constant failure, which is a constant failure probability. If the sample size, the, the, the size of your, of, of, of your sample is lower bounded by some quantity that scales as one over epsilon squared delta. This means that, this, this is very remarkable because this means that F is estimated up to constant additive error and constant uh, failure probability measuring only a constant number of observables. Right? So, uh, you, you know, there are, there are exponentially many observables to measure and you only need to measure a constant number of them. So by constant I mean N independent, right? Because of course it depends on your target error and your failure probability. Right? But you can do that uh, with a constant number of, me of measurements. Now, of course, there is a catch, and there, is, there are actually two catches. And I think that you, you should pay attention now because I think this is related to some questions that the students will have, no? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so to, make, to make your life easier. <laughs> so, there are two problems with direct fidelity estimation. Um, the first problem is that you need to sample, I mean, to work out what, what the observables that you, that you have to use are, you need to sample from the target distribution. And I already mentioned that sampling from a distribution is not necessarily an easy thing. So we saw examples today, we were talking about uh, Boson sampling or, or, or QIP computations, where sampling from a given target distribution can, can be very hard for a classical computer. So I give you a target, and you know that there exists a measurement scheme that estimates your, your desired fidelity using only a constant number of measuring only a constant number of observables, but to but these observables have to be chosen randomly from the relevance distribution, and that can be hard. The, the, let's say the, the 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 computational complexity of sampling from a target distribution can be something very hard. So this is a problem. In practice, you can only do that for 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 a very restricted family of states, right? So this is this is um, let's say uh, one disadvantage of direct fidelity estimation from the point of view of the computational complexity of sampling problems. And the next disadvantage, the, the other disadvantage is that suppose that you manage to sample efficiently and to choose the observables that you have to measure. You know that there's only a constant number of them that you have to measure, but now you have to estimate the expectation value of each of each observable. Right now, since x is defined as the characteristic function of rho p divided by the characteristic function of rho t, uh, then and and what you when you go to the lab you have to estimate the the characteristic function of rho p, then the precision up to which this characteristic function has to be estimated uh, goes as uh, let's say so so it has to be estimated up to error that has to scale. Uh, that has to be of the order of this of this denominator. No, imagine that you have a target you have a target state. You calculate the characteristic function, and this can in general be exponentially small. Now you go to the lab and you measure the num the numerator here. But if the if the random variable is x and and you measure a numerator with some constant error and you divide it by something that is exponentially small, 
then error propagates and you get a total error of x that is exponentially large. This means that you, you, need, to, you need to acquire statistics enough to, to let's say, to, 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 to have an estimate of chi rho p whose error, whose, whose error scales uh, of the, as the order of chi of rho t, right? So this, so there are, there are two problems with direct fidelity estimation technique. The first one, what I showed, is the computational complexity of sampling from the, from the, from the relevance distribution. And the second one is the sample complexity of each estimation. Even if you know which observables you have to measure, estimating the expectation value of them might require an exponential number of preparations to acquire enough statistics. And this happens in practice, this happens for very restricted families of states. So it's a very elegant, very nice technique. It always, in principle, gives you an estimate with a constant number of observables, but choosing those observables can be computationally hard, and estimating the expectation value of, of each uh, observable can be uh, hard from the point of view, let's say, can have a very large uh, sample complexity. Um, and of course, this is even, this is, so this is an example for, for, for continuous variable. If your target state is a multi-mode coherent state, you calculate the, the, the characteristic function, and this already scales exponentially. This goes exponentially small with, with a number of modes. So this means that even for a simplest target state as coherent state, multi-mode coherent state, which are product states, this, 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 will, this, this doesn't work. In continuous variables, there is no state. So, so, so I mean, the condition is that the condition for this to work is that the states are well conditioned, meaning that this, the, the characteristic function of the target can be sort of truncated at some point. So this happens when the characteristic function is very, very localized. You truncate it here, and then you, sub, you, 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 you set it to zero in, 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 in the rest, and then you can do that, that efficiently. Those states are called well conditioned states, and this doesn't, hap this doesn't happen in continuous variable for any state. Um, so can we do better? And uh, well, with this, I would like to finish. And um, so, so, as conclusions, we uh, we, we discuss the motivations of of of, of, of quantum certification. There are three motivations from the practical point of view. Uh, we won't go much further in, in the experimental advance if we don't have reliable pra practical reliable certification tools. Uh, it is also interesting from the point of view of testing quantum mechanics in high-complexity high regime that are still unexplored. Uh, I mentioned the possibility of thinking quantum, of quantum certification as, as instances of quantum supremacy. And then we talked about sampling problems and I reviewed a little bit the history of, of, of quantum state characterization from full tomography to MPS tomography, each one having its own advantages and limitations but none of them offering really a, a, a scalable, practical answer. And then also, finally, direct fidelity estimation, which is much more efficient from the point, of course, you don't reconstruct the whole state, but you can certify. But uh, it, 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 it is, it is in, in practice, it applies all, only for a restricted family of states that are called well-conditioned states. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and uh, yeah, hopefully see you the next lecture.